This is an ABC News children's special. President Clinton, answering children's questions. Now reporting from the White House in Washington, D.C., Peter Jennings. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, particularly boys and girls. This is a pretty exciting opportunity for us to come to the White House on a Saturday morning to see President Clinton. It's one of the very first formal visits he's had since he became president one month ago exactly today. Over in the residence in the White House in the East Room, we have a lot of kids uh, from various parts of the country who I know have questions for Mr. Clinton. And of course, there's an opportunity for you all around the country to ask some questions of the president. And we'll give you an 800 phone number if you happen to have a pencil happening not very long from now. The telephone number you can see there on your screen, I have it on a card here, is 1-800-648-8094. Now, this may look just like a pretty ordinary corridor in the White House for you, but we're actually right outside the Oval Office, and you can tell because there's a uniformed member of the Secret Service here watching over the President, who's working inside. Now, he obviously knows we're here, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But let's go in and say good morning. Well, I'm actually working on something that your young viewers might be interested in. This is a decision-making memo on our national service plan to make college education available to more young people if after they get out of college or before they go to college, they'll do some service for people here at home. Great. I think some of the kids on the other side of the White House would like to talk to you about that. I'd like, if you don't mind, to talk a little about where we are. We're in the Oval Office. We're in the Oval Office. This is the President's office. It has been the office of the president for a very long time. President Roosevelt actually moved it to this particular site in the White House. But as you can see, it's a, a very beautiful office with a wonderful painting of our first president, George Washington, over the uh, mantelpiece by Peel. Does it feel like your office yet? So I, I was telling the audience it's a month today. Yes, it is. Actually, it does. I, uh, I have really come to like working here. I've, I haven't made a lot of changes. I, I brought in a few pieces of art, like this wonderful piece of uh, Native American sculpture right. uh, from 1913. This was done in 1913. And there's a wonderful painting over there that's a, a very famous painting that's never before been in the Oval Office, we but it's been in the White House, of all the American flags. This is a parade in New York City for Flag Day during World War I in 1917. And as you can see, the people are walking with their umbrellas in the rain, mm -hmm. and all the flags are waving. It's a very beautiful. And Rodas Inc. underneath. Yes, this was given to us by Mr. and Mrs. Canner, who are supporters of, mm -hmm. of Hillary's and mine. And they loaned us this wonderful sculpture just for the term of my presidency so that I could always look over and see Rodan thinking when I had to be thinking. <laughs> somebody, so to think of this. Somebody, you know, when you made your speech in the White House on last Monday night. Yes. Somebody told me that you had a Rodin, Rodin sculpture here and somebody in the White House made you move it. And I said, well, who's the boss around here? <laughs> no, no. We had it there and we decided to put it over there. We thought oh, it would I look see. better. Are you completely That way I can see it all the time. It's <laughs> over there. See. Are you completely and absolutely in charge in this <laughs> house all the time? I, no, I wouldn't say that. No. There, uh, you know, things have been working uh, here in the White House in a certain way for a long time. So I adapt it to my style, mm -hmm. but some of the things are just... Uh, I suppose they go from president mm -hmm. to president, especially over in the living quarters. I think the boys and girls particularly, I think everybody, but boys and girls particularly would like to know something about the desk. It's probably the most famous desk in the country. That's right. This is the desk that I use here. This desk has belonged to the White House since 1880. It's called the Resolute. It was given to the United States by Queen Victoria of England, and it's made from the timbers of a ship that ran aground, was rescued by Americans. They gave the ship back to England. Mm -hmm. Then when the ship was dismantled, she had the desk made and given here to the White House. But no president used this desk in the Oval Office until President John Kennedy. Oh, I think we all remember it from President Kennedy right. in part because John John used to play underneath, right. right? And you remember he crawled out through this, uh, this little door here. I guess it's the most famous picture of a child ever made here in the Oval Office. So he crawled out through the swing door with the symbol of the United States there. But President Kennedy used it. and. Uh, President Bush had it upstairs. And we have a private office, the right. presidents do, upstairs in the residence. But when I was elected, I had it brought down, down, back down to the Oval Office. Well, you know, we have a lot of experts waiting to talk to you this morning. I'm ready to I see I know you're like, so why don't you put on your blazer? And uh, we will go over 
to the residence, which is in the east wing, or the east side of the White House, because we're in the west wing of the White House now. We're going to go out into the garden here and then across through that colonnade there to the actual residence where President and Mrs. Clinton and Chelsea live. And there you, sir, will have your first opportunity to talk to a lot of kids. It's great. I'm looking forward to it. We'll be back in just a minute. I, William Jefferson Clinton. What's it like to be president? Is it hard and frustrating? I have trouble sleeping. What made you want to become president? Mr. President, who's your favorite saxophonist? We must provide for our nation the way a family provides for its children. What are you going to do to save our environment? How are you going to stop or reduce toxic waste? What are you going to do so that everybody can afford medical care? What are you going to do about AIDS? How are you going to prevent drug use? Each day we delay, really making a commitment to our children carries a dear cost. How do you plan on cutting the unemployment rate? I know you can't, like, pull jobs right out of a hat, but how are you going to Mr. President, do it? what are you going to do about poverty? How come you could feed people in Somalia and you can't feed people in America? Why isn't he have given any money to the homeless people so they can have a place to live? I ask every American. Look simply into your own heart, to spark your own hopes, to fire your own imagination. Mr. President, are you going to keep your promises? President Clinton, answering children's questions. We'll continue in a moment. Mr. President, one of my first impressions here is that this is an awful lot bigger than what you were used to living in Arkansas. <laughs> it's bigger than almost anybody in America lives in. But it's a beautiful house, you know. It was started. Uh, in 1792, okay. President Washington authorized it to be built, and then before it was finished, actually, President Adams and his wife moved in here. So it's been here a long time. Right behind us here, of course, we, we, we can't go in this morning, but it's really one of the most beautiful rooms, the Blue Room, looking out under the Jefferson Memorial. It's very beautiful, and upstairs, just above it, there's another big oval room, which President Franklin Roosevelt used as his office during World War II, and now we use it for formal receiving of foreign dignitaries, and it also looks directly out on the Jefferson Memorial, and there's a porch there that President Harry Truman put on. So I can go out at night now and look at the light shining down on Thomas Jefferson's head. It's a wonderful sight. You know, the, the White House staff is very discreet. When I asked them if you sneaked around sticking your heads in various rooms at night, they said, ask him. Do you wander <laughs> do. around at night? I do a little. Yeah. Not so much down here, but up on the second and third floor. And uh, I spent a lot of time working in this last month over around the Oval Office. So I'm in the cabinet room a lot and in the Roosevelt room, which is the president's uh, big staff room. And I'm just trying to learn what all the pictures are and where all the things are, you know, and learn the history of the place. I'm very interested in it. I just have one question before we go and actually meet the children. There's the president's seal up there, the president of the United States, just above the door of the blue room there. It reminds me of Teddy White, the political writer, who said there is a moment when a man stops being a man and becomes the president. Was there such a moment for you? Do you remember it? I think there was a moment when I realized I was going to be president, and it was different after that. And it was not at the election. It was a couple of weeks after the election when I was planning the inaugural, and they asked me what I wanted to do. And I, we decided that I would start at Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello, then go to the Lincoln Memorial. And then the next morning, I would go to the graves of President Kennedy and his brother, Senator Robert Kennedy. And I realized in describing that that's what I would do, that I was becoming a part of our history. Well, you indeed, and there uh, these young boys and girls between about 8 and 15 from Washington and other parts around the country are very interested in you and history. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You're welcome, the President. Nice to have him this week. Hello. Wow. Nice to see you. Well, I think they have a lot of questions on it. Who wants to ask the first question? 
Okay, way at the back here. Demetrius. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you a question that goes back to about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, back in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, if you were in the same position that you are now and during the time of the, um, of the occurrence of the Little Rock um, Nine, how would you take forth the matters about them going into the school? Would you go with the um, community or would you go with your heart? Boy, that's a I would have done. I would have gone with my heart and with the law of the United States, which was that the children had a right to go to the school without regard to their race. I would have done what President Eisenhower did. I would have sent troops there and done whatever it took to give the children the right to go to school. One of the people who was part of the Little Rock Nine, uh, Ernest Green, is now a business executive here in Washington and a good friend of mine. And I'm glad he had a chance to do that. Mr. President, excuse me, I don't think everybody knows who the Little Rock Nine were. Oh, what he's asking about, it, about 40 years ago, a lot of the schools, public schools in our country, were still segregated by race. And all, virtually all the schools in the southern part of the United States were segregated by race. Young black and white children went to different schools. 40 years ago, the courts ruled that we could no longer segregate schools by race. In my hometown of Little Rock, in the capital city, uh, the governor and the local school board tried to keep them separate. President Eisenhower then ordered troops there to open the school so that the schools could be integrated. He was asking me if I would do the same thing, and I said I would. A Good stool. for you. Great question. There's a stool behind you, Mr. President, if you feel like sitting on it. Who else has got a... We, we kind of broke it down into fun questions and serious questions. Who had a fun question they wanted to start with? All right, Jed? Um, do you help Chelsea with her homework? I do. <laughs> uh, I do uh, math with her quite often. I, I took a lot of uh, algebra and advanced mathematics in high school, and then I didn't take any more after I went to college. So when Chelsea got into algebra, she started asking me to help. And so I, I've used it sort of to learn algebra again. It's been a lot of fun for me. I enjoy it a lot. We do it quite often at night or early in the morning. Now, Mr. President, people all over the country who uh, I know want to ask you questions, we have an 800 number, which we'll put up on the screen. It's been up for a while and people have been trying to call in, so take a look. 1-800-648-8094. And I know we have a call from Kim in Minnesota. Go ahead, Kim. Hi. Um, my question is, why can't women be president? Why is it just men? Well, women can be president, Kim. No woman has been elected president yet, but we now have a significant number of women in the United States Senate. We've had a good number of women governors. We have a large number of women in the House of Representatives. And I think that there will be a woman elected president in the not too distant future. I think that the American people uh, used to be prejudiced against women in public life. And women didn't even have the right to vote guaranteed until, uh, well, less than 100 years ago. But it's been done now. Uh, in every other political office in the country, and I think you'll see a woman president before long. Maybe it'll be you if you work hard and, mm. and uh, do what you can to get involved in public affairs. I wonder if we can test the confidence level on that statement in here. How many of you girls, or young women, think you, a woman will be president in your lifetime? Oh, confidence level's very high. Who's got the next question? How about you, Shannon? Yes, L.A. Riot. We have a lot of empty buildings, and a lot of people in our neighborhood want to open businesses. I want to know how can you have low interest loans to help minorities build um, shops and buildings? Mr. President, before you answer that question of Shannon, I didn't, I forgot for a second. Would you like to see a little bit of where she comes from? Sure, I would. We have, uh, Shannon has come here to us from Los Angeles today. And how many kids have come from different parts of the country? Just give the president some indication. See, we have a large contingent from other parts of the country. And Shannon comes from Los Angeles. And here's a little bit about the way she lives. You can look at the monitor, sir. We were sitting down watching the news. And by that time, my mother had gotten home. And she said, it's a mess down on um, Florence and Normandy. We went outside and we saw flames and smoke around our area. So we just went back in our house because there was nothing we could do. We saw everybody looting and burning up places. The um, streets were jammed, jammed up. So we were just watching the people go crazy. Since the riots, there's a lot of empty buildings around here. I know we're in you know, in debt, but 
a lot of that money needs to go back to the community where it's coming from. So her question about low interest loans from minorities makes a lot of sense. Good for you, it does. Let me tell you two or three things we're working on here. First of all, I'm trying to set up uh, in all the big cities throughout the country a financial institution that will make low interest loans to people who live in those communities. Uh, there is such a bank in Chicago that's done a very good job of rebuilding some of the poor communities through setting up businesses. The second thing that I want to do is to get the Congress to pass a bill which will give people special incentives to invest funds in communities like South Central Los Angeles. If you put money in places where there's a lot of unemployment, a lot of empty buildings, you get a special tax break for doing it. And the third thing I have asked Congress to do is to pass a bill to benefit small business people so that as long as they keep investing money to create jobs, they'll have their taxes lowered for doing that. And I think these things are very important. I'm glad you asked. Let me just mention one other thing. Uh, one of the provisions of the economic plan I sent to Congress would also permit us to create about 700,000 summer jobs this summer for young people, which would get them active. And then they could be used to clean up the area and to help people uh, make the parks more attractive and to do things to make those areas better and make people want to invest in them more. We've got a lot of work to do, and I'm glad you asked the question. All right, we have a question down here in the front row. Yes, Karis. I would like to ask, um, when, if we have, if we start health care programs, when we start them, who is going to pay for them? Who's going to fund them? Well, first of all, we're already paying a lot of money on health care. Your country, believe it or not, has the most expensive health care system in the world. We spend much more for health care than any other country, but a lot of Americans don't have health insurance. You know that, don't you? A lot of Americans don't have health care. So what I think will happen is that we will have a health care system which will be paid for partly by the government and partly by people uh, who are employers and partly by the people who work for them. We'll have We'll pay for it in three ways, but what we've got to do is to find a way to provide basic health care to all Americans, including people who have serious health problems. I know there's some people in this audience today who have members of your family with serious health problems. And to keep the cost down more like what it costs in other countries, because otherwise we're going to be hurt very bad economically. One of the reasons we're having trouble generating a lot of new jobs in this country is that our businesses are spending so much more money for health care than any other businesses anywhere in the world, that they have less money to invest to put people to work. So my job is to do two things that are hard to do, to get health care for everybody, and then to bring the cost mm -hmm. down. We have a phone call from Connecticut. Go ahead, Connecticut. I was wondering, um, what made you have the burden to become the president? I mean, why did I want to become president? Yeah. It's a good question, Andrew. I decided to run for president in 1991 because I was concerned that there were too many people in America who were out of work. There were too many people who were losing their jobs. There were too many people who had problems with health care. There was, there was too much uh, indication that we weren't uh, building a future so that young people like you would be able to grow up and have a better life than your parents did. And I was afraid that the American dream was in danger. I thought I had some good ideas about how to turn it around and how to make life better for the American people, and that's why I ran. I asked the American people to listen to my ideas, and they were good enough to vote for me and give me a chance to serve. Now, I know a lot of you have questions about exactly how the president spends his day. Who's got a question about how the pre what the president does in the White House? Yes, David. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, you were just coming down the hall in the Oval Office showing us how nice, you know, everything around here is. Just look around the room. And I don't know, personally, if I lived here, I would be, I would feel constrained to actually live, you know? I mean, it's just so <laughs> nice that everything is so perfect. I would not, I mean, I don't know. So how do you feel about it? I feel a little that way, too, sometimes. But let me say that uh, upstairs on the second floor, there are some nice formal guest rooms, but there also is... Chelsea has a, a bedroom and a little room to, where she can study and do her work. And Hillary and I have a, a bedroom and a, a little family room. And it's, they're not quite so formal. So the rooms that we have are much more like regular rooms in a house. And you don't have to worry so much about breaking an expensive mm -hmm. piece of 
China or something like that. But it wasn't always so formal here, was it, Mr. President? The East Room, they used to hang laundry in the East Room. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't always so formal at all. It, it's probably as formal now as it's ever been, but there are some more informal rooms. And then there's a third floor, a floor, two floors up from here, which has some other rooms and uh, a little hallway where we have our rocking chairs and our family books and all kind of stuff like that, which is really much more mm -hmm. homey. So we spend a lot of that, uh, time in places where we don't have to go on tiptoes all around. We said we were going to test you on some of the questions here. Do you know the children of which president roller skated in here in the East Room? Who no. remembers that? Yes, Carlos. Roosevelt. Which Roosevelt? Um, Teddy. Exactly. President Theodore Roosevelt's children used to roller skate here in the East Room. And of course, maybe you'd like to point out to the kids the famous painting. Yes. That's a picture of who? Who is that? Um, that's right. That's President Washington, painted by Gilbert Stewart. And it is an absolutely invaluable piece of art. Gilbert Stewart was a very famous artist. I think it was offered to the United States first for about $500. He painted it in 1797. That was a lot of money back then. It's worth millions of dollars today. It's a priceless picture. And who saved it? Excuse me? Who saved it? Who Do saved it? Dolly Madison, right? Yeah, Dolly Madison yeah. saved it. When there was From the fire. She wouldn't leave the White House until the... Yeah, during the War of 1812, <clears throat> The British marched on Washington and tried to burn the city, and the White House caught fire. There's still some char marks actually out on the front of the White House, and Dolly Madison would not leave the White House until the precious treasures were preserved, including that. There's also a picture back there of President Theodore Roosevelt, painted when he was a year younger than I am now. Theodore Roosevelt was the youngest person ever to become president. He was elected president at the age, uh, well, he became president when President McKinley died. He was 42. And President Kennedy was elected when he was 43. And I was elected when I had just turned 46. So I'm the third youngest person. But not yet. You probably need a bit of rest for the moment, though, Serge. You're the third youngest. So we'll go away for a commercial and come right back. <laughs> I feel like the oldest <laughs> some days. <laughs> President Clinton answering children's questions will continue in a moment. On the loose on Capitol Hill, it's Stephen Q. Urkel. When we come back, Urkel hits the House, storms the Senate, and from the halls of Congress to the President's desk, Urkel finds out how a bill becomes a law. It comes directly to William Jefferson Clinton. Whoa, mama! Today's ABC News Children's Special, President Clinton answering children's questions. We'll continue after this from our ABC stations. <laughs> Welcome back to the East Room of the White House. Let's go straight to you. Jared, you have a question. What do you do for fun around here? <laughs> I, uh, I like to play golf. I've only gotten to do it one time since I've been president, but I like to do that. And I like to play cards and games with uh, Hillary and Chelsea. We play uh, Pinochle. We play a game that Chelsea taught me called Hungarian Rummy. I like to play Trivial Pursuit. That's pretty much what I do. You're a good Trivial Pursuit player? Sometimes. I'm better on some subjects than others, but uh, I like it a lot. Alicia, way over there in the corner. Shay. Alicia, I'm sorry. About Somalia huh? uh, and um, the United States, are we going to help the United States or Somalia first? Because Somalia has been in trouble for years, but, but we haven't done anything. We've done something, but not that much. So are you going to start helping Somalia first or getting the United States their jobs back first? Well, my most important job is to try to help people in the United States get their jobs back because I was elected first and most importantly to help the people here with jobs and education and health care. But I think the United States has a responsibility in Somalia and I supported it when we sent our troops over there to try to stop the fighting and to try to bring some safety and food and medicine, education back to the students there, the children there. And I think that what we will be doing in Somalia 
is trying to work with other countries to always keep enough soldiers there to try to keep the peace, but there won't be so many Americans there, and then we can support others and try to make sure that we restore peace on a long-term basis and try to make sure that the people always had enough food and medicine and shelter to, to do well. I think we do have a responsibility there, but as President, my first responsibility is to all of you. Behind you here, Mr. President, Jeannie has a question. Jeannie Lee. Um, Hi, Jeannie. How do you how do you feel like now that you're the President of the United States? It's an incredible honor. And every day I, I still get up and, and I feel a lot of gratitude just for having the chance to serve. I also feel a big sense of responsibility. I, I, I don't want to let you down, all of you and, and all the people all over the country, the people who voted for me and those who didn't. I, I hope I can do a, a good job to help solve our problems and move us forward. Jeannie, what do you think is probably the best thing about being president? If you were him, what would you guess? I think I would have a lot of responsibility, too, because I got to take care of the whole United States, and I got to help others. And you've got to um, help the people of the United States um, fight their enemies and crime and riots and gangs. Right behind you, Willie. Um, um, what it, when you were in, like, our house, in grade, what was your hardest subject in school? When I was in your, when I was your age? <laughs> Sounds How old like are it. you? How old are you? Nine. Nine, you're in the fourth grade? No. I made my lowest grades in conduct. <laughs> 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 because I talked too much in school and the teachers were always telling me to stop talking. Uh, I did best in math. I did well in reading. I had some trouble spelling, interestingly enough, when I was young, because I was, I'd get excited and I'd go too fast, and sometimes I wouldn't spell so well. Um, um, what you gonna do about um, the environment? Cause well, Willie, let me let me let me hold the president on the environment for just a sec, if that's okay with you, because I think touching on education is re is really interesting. Mr. President, I'd like you to meet Michael Cruz here. We met Michael uh, mm -hmm. out in the country, and. We did a little film about him, which I'd like you to see, because I know he has a question. And it's something I know that he cares a lot about and he'd like to ask you about. So let's, first of all, look at where Michael goes to school. Fear. Fear is, is part of your life. You're scared, because you, you don't know what's going to happen once you turn that corner. I'm afraid of the gangs, the, the violence, the fear of just trying to get to school. There's police officers there. <laughs> the fights are mainly in the hallways by the escalators, whether it's with gangs or just kids. When they try to fight, they try to try to kill each other. You and me, bro. Well, to see one of my friends arrested, it's pretty hard because he's losing out on education, what he really needs. This is one day. My class is mostly empty. The reason why some don't come is because they're probably scared of the same as me. I really need help in writing, reading, and speaking proper language. I don't really think I'm prepared to take any kind of test. I know deep down inside I could learn more, but with that fear in the way, it's pretty hard. Well, Michael goes to the Roberto Clemente High School in Chicago, Illinois. Got a question for the president, Michael? Um, how are you going to make my school safer to get a better education? Let me, I have an answer to that, but let me ask you first so I won't prejudice your answer. If you were in my position, what would you do to make the school safer? I would, I would try to get as much teachers and, and mainly security guards in there to keep the violence, because now there's not so many security guards and there's too many students. I'll just try to control the school first, and then once I control the school, then I'll throw the education on the lap. Let me tell you what we're going to try to do. First of all, as, as part of the economic program I sent to Congress, there is a Safe Schools Initiative, which if it passes would enable us to help schools to, uh, with more security guards and with more uh, like metal detectors and things like that to try to make sure kids don't come to school with weapons. Secondly, uh, I have offered a program that would permit us to, to put another 100,000 police officers on the street in America in the next couple of years including people who could be stationed in and around schools. The third thing I think we ought to do is to pass a bill which says that nobody can buy a handgun unless there's a waiting period 
during which time you can check their criminal history and see if they've been in any trouble before. Is you don't have to sell them guns if, if they have been in trouble before. But if you don't check, you don't know. I think that's a good place to start. But let me also say, you're from Chicago, right? I was in a junior high school in Chicago not very long ago called the Beasley Academic Center. It's a public school in Chicago. Do you know where it is? It's in a neighborhood with a very high crime rate. And they have police outside the school. Now, I know it's not a high school. It's a junior high school. There are police outside the school, but not in the school, because the teacher has to deal with, she's got 75 fathers a week coming to the school, 150 mothers a week coming to the school, and the kids have a, a whole strict code of conduct. They ask to go there, but you, there's no academic requirement. You know, if everybody asks to go, and if there are too many who ask, then they do it by lottery. But, but the kids that go there really help to keep the peace in their own school, supporting mm -hmm. the principal. And with the parents involved, I think that's real important, too. I can provide extra help for law enforcement, but we've got to get more grassroots community people involved. I love seeing you in that class, and I just hope that a year or two from now, all those other desks will be full, too. And don't you give up on your education, because don't let anybody else, no matter what their problems are, take your future away from you. Only you can do that. You know, there's something else about, uh, about Michael, which I'm not sure I'm right about, Michael. Did I hear that, that some of the kids in your school teased you badly about coming to see the president? Yeah. yeah. Uh, why? Why did they do that? Because people, people, don't want, people don't believe that. People don't want to believe it. You mean they don't believe that I care anything about them? Yeah, in a way you can say it like that. Do you think the president's answer to you was, I mean, did, did it give you some satisfaction? Yeah. It gave me a lot. Look, you know, when I was your age, it was a lot easier to be young than it is now. You know, we, we, uh, we worried about liquor and cigarettes. Nobody worried about drugs and guns. And I know it's hard to be young now. But I also know that if you get a good education, nobody can take that away from you. You can still have a good life. And there are people there who care about your education. And I'm going to do what I can to support them. Katie, right up there behind Michael, I think you have a question, don't you? Um, yes. I'm homeschooled. I don't go to school. And I was wondering what you thought about homeschooling and if, what you were going to do about it, or if there was anything you were going to do. Can you explain what homeschooling is? Yes. Um, my parents um, teach me at home, so I don't go to school. They don't really believe like, the stuff that's being, some of the stuff that's being taught and done in the schools. I can tell you what I have done about it. Let me say, let me tell all of you this, just by way of background. The public schools of our country are largely uh, run at the local level by school boards and school administrators. And the money for them and the rules by which they are run are largely set at the state level, by the state governments throughout the country. So you're from Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, the state government in Richmond largely makes the rules for the public schools. I was a governor before I became president. And while I was governor, I supported and passed a law through our legislature which made homeschooling legal and which supported homeschooling and, and parents and children making the decision to be educated at home as long as the children were willing to take examinations every year and prove that they were learning what they should be learning for people their age. And that's the way I feel. I think that your parents and you as a family should have the right to do this as long as you're learning. And if you can demonstrate that you're learning, I think you should have the right to do it. Can I interrupt, sir? Because I, I don't think people really understand why many parents want to teach or insist on teaching their children at home. A lot of it has to do with sex education, doesn't it? Well, I think a lot. It, it's different for different people. I think there are, and Katie, you can interrupt me or say what you think, but I have talked to a lot of parents and children who've been in the homeschooling movement. And normally, they fall into two groups. There are, are, there's one group, perhaps the smaller one, uh, who believes that they just give their kids a better education, that, you know, they're, 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 that the kids learn more and more quickly. Then there's a second set of concerns which revolve around values. A lot of parents are really upset by what Michael just said, that, that kids go to school, they have to worry about being exposed to violence, to premature sex, to drugs, uh, to things that they may not agree with. So there are the, what you might call the values objections, the, mm. the things that children are exposed to, and then the academic mm. objections. Who, who, Is that a fair statement? Mm. Who's got, somebody's got some questions about the White House. I want to make sure that I don't lose who's got questions about the White House. Um, no, Omar, Willie, we, Willie, we've talked Omar to you. And Omar. Omar. And Megan Omar. Does Hillary ever cook for you? Does Hillary ever cook for me? <laughs> sometimes. And sometimes. 
believe it or not, sometimes we cook for each other, but we, we've been so busy lately, we haven't had a chance to do it since we've been here. But Hillary's a, a, actually a pretty good cook. And I, I actually, I like to cook, but what I like to do is to make things like omelets. I love to make omelets, and sometimes on Sunday nights, Hillary and Chelsea and I will go into the kitchen and I'll make everybody omelets and we'll sit around and talk. So both of us like to cook, but we've been, you know, I asked Hillary to take charge of the health care problem and try to come up with a solution to it. And uh, I've been working real hard on the economic problem, so neither of us has had much time to cook, and they, are, they have wonderful cooks here. As a matter of fact, Chelsea could tell you there's, there's a whole little kitchen where they don't do anything but make pastry and sweet things. They don't, they don't hate that here, sir. Oh. <laughs> so I've been mostly relying on those folks, but yes, she does cook for me sometimes. What about Ellie, right at the back? Ellie. Well, my question is sort of serious. Um, well, if it's serious, let's hold it for one second. We'll go to a commercial, come right back. Okay, okay? my apologies. President Clinton, answering children's questions, will continue in a moment. You have to uh, you have to work on Omar a bit here because he's telling me he's a Republican. Oh, I'll pray. <laughs> Please wear my button. When we were away for commercial, some of these kids said you look a lot better in person than you do on television. <laughs> well, that's good. Want to, to hear. deal with that? <laughs> well, sometimes I have these big bags under my eyes when I don't get any sleep the night before if I work late, or when my allergies are bad. And uh, so I'm glad you think I look better, but I feel better today. Carlos, what did you want to know? Um. You want to know where socks was? Yeah. Socks is just around the corner and downstairs. It's well, here all the time. I also want to know something else. What are you do? What are you going to do about um, why the sc school board is doing about closing ten schools in every ward here in D.C. Well, that's a different question because some the, the you know the, the Washington D.C. government does get some money directly from from the Congress and the President. Uh, I can't answer that question today because I don't know whether they're closing down the schools because they don't have enough money to run them or because they have too many schools for the kids that are there now. There, that is, a lot of school districts in America are losing school populations. So, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look into it and I've got your address and I'll write you a letter about it, okay? Okay, well, that's really nice. a little more I need to tell you. Um, can you at least talk to them to close to not close the good ones, because my, they might close my school, and my school is the only elementary school that's bilingual in all D.C. Oh, well, you don't want them to do that, do you? Because we have a lot of bilingual kids in, in D.C., don't we now? Thank you. I, I'll look into that, and I'll get back in touch with you. Okay, we have a phone call, Mr. President, I think from Texas. Oh, yeah. Oh, Elliot. Go ahead, Allison. Do you believe? I can't hear you, Allison. Do you, what is the Brady Bill? What is the Brady Bill? Oh, what is the Brady Bill? The Brady Bill is a bill I was just actually talking about. It's a bill that would require people who want to buy handguns to wait for a few days while the people who sell the handguns check to see if they have committed a, a crime or if they have a mental health history or some other problem, which would make it dangerous for them to get the handgun. And the Brady Bill would require people to wait just a few days until that check is done. I strongly support the Brady Bill. Some people are against it, but I think it's a good idea just to, to, to wait a couple of days. I don't think it's much of an inconvenience for people who want to buy guns to ask them to wait so we can check their criminal, health, criminal history. I almost forgot you, Ellie. I'm sorry. Um, the opposition to your recent attempt to lift the ban on homosexuals in the military shows that as a society, we're still, or we are, very biased towards homosexuals. What are you going to do to help America as a nation accept them? Well, I think what's important about that issue to me is not that uh, Americans agree with the lifestyle, but that they, that they accept the fact that there are citizens in the United States who are homosexual who work hard, who don't break laws, who pay their taxes, don't bother other people, and ought to have a chance to serve. And I, th I just say that at every uh, chance I get, and I have also uh, been involved in giving some people the chance to serve. 
who were homosexual, and I think that's important. I think that uh, there are a lot of people uh, whose religious beliefs dictate that uh, the homosexual lifestyle is wrong. I don't ask them to give up their religious beliefs, but simply to accept other people as people and give them a chance to be citizens as long as they're not doing anything wrong. That's my position on that. Anastasia, you've had your hand up a lot. Um, Maybe, Mr. President, you'd like to come and sit hi, down Anastasia. for a second. Excuse yeah. me for one second, reaching over here. Come and sit here. Sarah. Sarah, you come and sit here if you wouldn't let the President sit down. I oh, think. Okay. 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 I have a twin sister, and we go to the same school, but she can't speak. So because she can't speak, they put her in a special class. But she uses computers to speak, and what? I would like her to be in a regular class, just like me. Wow. And you think your sister could do just as well as you in a regular class? Yes. As long as she can use her computer. And her computer is on a little top, just like this, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you can put it on here, and you can put it on regular tables also. Because you can carry it around. It's a little computer. And she talks to you by using it? Yeah. Why do you think they put her in the special education class? I think it's because she couldn't talk and they thought the principal thinks that she can't do it because she can't use her hands and she can't speak. But you think that she could learn just as quickly if she were in a regular class? Yes. Have your parents asked the principal to put her in a regular yes. class? Yes. And they said no? The principal said no. Well, you know, the, as president, I can't do anything about that except to speak about it. But I'll tell you this. I have a friend named Hamp Rasco, whose mother works for me here. And he's now 18 years old. He has cerebral palsy. And he doesn't speak quite as well as you, but he can probably speak a little more than your sister. And I have watched him go all the way through high school and graduate from high school and get his graduation ring. He lives out on his own now. And I'm going to do what I can to help people let all Americans go as far as they can. And I think young people who are working hard to prove they can do this kind of work ought to be given the chance to do it. And I think your sister should be given the chance to show whether she can work in the class or not. That's what you think, isn't it? You just wanted to have a chance to prove whether she yeah. could do it or not, right? Yes. Yeah. And if she tried and she couldn't do it, then would you support her being in another class? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you just want your sister to have a chance? Yes. Yeah. Good for you. Maybe she'll get it because we were here talking about this. I have a feeling. Thanks, Anastasia, very much. You're Thank you, welcome. Mr. President. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. Wasn't that great? <laughs> yes, good. Thanks for sticking up for your sister. That's wonderful. We have a phone call from Ian. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, President Clinton, how will you stop pollution in the United States? Just like that. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not quite that simple because, you know, we make pollution every day, Ian. When we drive our cars, we make pollution. When we run our factories, we make pollution. But there are two or three things we can do. Let me just mention them. Number one, we have a Clean Air Act in the United States, designed to reduce the amount of pollution that goes into the air in the first place. I want to enforce that. Number two, I want to support clean water. We put a lot of stuff in our water. I want to reduce that. Number three, I want to try to do things that will help preserve the quality of the environment in the first place, like planting more trees and reforesting the land and building up the soil of the United States. I think you, you, we want to clean up the things that are being polluted but we want to stop things from being polluted as much as possible. And then finally, I'm trying to promote more energy conservation and cleaner energy, like natural gas, for example, is the cleanest form of energy that we can burn. So I'm trying to promote the use of natural gas. Those are the things that I think we should do in the beginning. I don't think anybody in the East Room, Mr. President, feels as strongly about that as Purnell does. And I know he has a question to ask here. But before you ask your question, Purnell, let's show the President a little bit about where you live. It's not a pretty sight. Just to use your five senses on the environment outside, it's, it's terrible. The air pollution, water pollution, and ground pollution makes me feel worried. It's 
My brother Charlie, right after he finished his fourth grade year, we had discovered a very rare brain tumor. The experts never could find out what the cause was. But the only thing we never really checked on was the environment. So there's a very good possibility that pollution could have caused that. All of the rest of the cancer victims in my family are still going through some suffering because of cancer. We don't really know what it's from. We suspect it to be the environment. Mr. President, I want to solve this problem. Cornell comes from Garyville, Louisiana, and it's about a 100-mile strip between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, right, Cornell? Where yes. there are about 100 petrochemical plants. Yes, I live, uh, Garyville, the small town that I live in, is right between the chemical corridor, which is the area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And, Mr. President, I'd like to ask if restrictions can be put on the amount of carelessly handled hazardous waste and air pollution, such as smoke, uh, and, you know, if health, uh, if the health care uh, system can get into this uh, somewhat and help the cancer victims, which may have, uh, which this cancer may have resulted from any of uh, this environmental contamination. Why don't you tell these folks how many relatives in your family have had cancer? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I know my 10-year-old brother died of, uh, of something that even the ex experts across the country uh, came over to Children's Hospital in New Orleans to look at this. They could not. They were just stumped. My brother Charlie was either the 10th or the 11th person in recorded history ever to catch this. And through all the other patients that caught this, they ex the experts could never figure it out. And they checked into just about every, uh, every condition that could have caused it, with the exception of the environment. Well, Sounds you know, like let me say, problem. this young man lives in Louisiana, which is just to the south of my home state of Arkansas. So I know quite a bit about where you live. And I've been in that alley between Baton Rouge and New Orleans many, many times. The cancer rate there is way above the national average. And I think there are two things we should be doing. One is we should be doing a lot more medical research to try to find out what causes these cancers. And the second thing we ought to be doing is to put, invest more money there to do environmental cleanup. In, in, the, um, in the election campaign that I went through to be elected president, I, I said many times, that I thought we ought to take some of the money that we're reducing the defense budget by and putting it into cleaning up the environment here at home. Because I think there are now all kinds of health hazards that we never knew about before that we're now learning about from some of the things we've done. And we need to, we need to do a lot of environmental cleanup uh, in that part of Louisiana where you live and throughout the country. And I'm going to do my best to do it. It's interesting, sir, that a lot of people were playing the budget game earlier, helping how to spend your money for you, and an awful lot of kids, both last night and tonight, all of them putting their money into cleaning up the environment. Now, how many of you think we should spend more money on the environment, cleaning it up? We've only got one planet. You know, if we don't preserve it, you know, there's no other place we can go to. And, you know, everyone, everyone from uh, my area and the surrounding areas, uh, most of them voted for you, you know. Uh, we all believe that, we all believe very strongly that you, as an individual, do have the know-how and the courage to go about and tackle this problem and any others. And we do have faith in you. We'll do it for your brother, okay? okay. We'll be back in just Thank a moment. President Clinton answering children's questions will continue in just a moment. I am 13. Now I live in Sarajevo. We were forced to leave our town on November 30th. Heavy shelling lasted until December 4th. People were running, children were screaming, panicking, people were being killed. 
I still have nightmares. The attack will never fade from my memory. I will always remember blood, that river, and all of my things that I do not have anymore. A lot of children lost their parents. I still think that although I have nothing, I have everything, because here are my parents, by my side. War is just a big monster which keeps eating people, and the children are suffering. <laughs> children in this war, who are not guilty at all, are being killed. President Clinton, do the children have to be victims of this stupid war? Today's ABC News Children's Special, President Clinton answering children's questions, will continue after this from our ABC stations. Once again, from the White House, Peter Jennings. Well, I haven't had a chance to ask you kids this question yet, but how, you've all heard President Clinton, put down your hands for just a second, all, you've all heard President Clinton say many things he'd like to do. Now, he's a very powerful individual, as I think we all agree, but he can't do it all by himself. You have to get a bill through Congress. That's right. You've budget bills up there now. You're going to have a real tough time. Real tough time. Right. Um, how many of you like to know how to get a bill through Congress? you think that would be useful in order to find out how you get it done? I'd like to know that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've enlisted the help of Stephen Urkel, who's a great, great uh, pal, I guess, of all your, to tell us how you actually get a bill through the Congress. Let's watch. Hi, ho, guys. I came to Washington to pass my own Clean Air Act, the Urkel Air Act. Most people think it's very difficult to get a bill passed, but I'm here to show you that it's as easy as growing mold. Um, oh. OK, let's go right to the numero uno, the head honcho, the biggest guy of all. <gasps> Mr. President. Hello. Wow. My name is Stephen Q. Urkel, and I was wondering if you can endorse my Urkel Air Bill. It will definitely provide a clean and safe environment. Let's think how to read it first. Well, that might be a good idea. Oh, would you like a copy? I would like a copy of it. Well, I'll make sure I get it over to you. Congress, this you know. is the place to start. Huh? In the Congress first, then I get to sign it. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, well, you can sign it right now. We can just bypass all that. <laughs> The Constitution gets in the way. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I shouldn't have. You just... sent me the bill. You're right. I'll, I'll send you the bill. Right. Wow, the president. Wow, I'm a shoe in there. to sponsor my latest bill. Okay. Holy Toledo, I'm your Senator Bob Dole. I'm Stephen Q. Urkel, and I need a sponsor. Mr. Urkel, how, how did you get in here? Well, I snuck in. But really, what I want to talk to you about is, I yes, was Mr. hoping Markle. you would read the first 100 pages of my bill. Or perhaps I can recite the first 100 pages to you. Let's see here. Huh? I, Stephen Q. Urkel, hereby submit to Congress a bill pertaining to clean air that will have a positive effect on all living organisms on this earth. And therefore, I submit for your sponsorship the Urkel Air Bill. If I sponsor your bill, will you get out of here? Oh, yes. Seriously, though, if your bill passes, it'd be better for all Americans. But you must have a House sponsor, because a bill must pass both the House and the Senate to become law. Oh, Bob, I knew that. I'm not just another pretty face. I could tell that. Oh, I feel good. I knew that I wouldn't. I feel good. I knew that I wouldn't. Congressman Fields, I just want to thank you for sponsoring my bill. And I especially want to thank you for just seeing me. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Urkel. But you see, I'm new on the Hill, and I just didn't know any better. Wow. Mr. Urkel, can I have a word with you? 
Aha! Uh -huh. You're a lobbyist. How do you know? Because we're in the lobby, baby. Mr. Urkel, I think I can convince the senator from Texas to support your bill if you could agree to a few civil amendments. Mr. Urkel, have you heard about this? Mr. Urkel, I'm not going to be able to Holy moly, you're Tom Foley. The speaker on the house. You're exactly the man I was looking for. Are you sure? Why, yes. You see, I have this bill, and it's in both houses, but I don't know what happens next. Well, here's how it works. Over there is the United States Senate, made up of 100 senators, two from each state. And over there is the United States House of Representatives, where we have 435 representatives representing all the American people. Oh. And for your bill to become law, a majority, at least half plus one, of each one of those two bodies has to approve it. Now, before we vote on it in the House of Representatives, we sent your bill to a smaller group of representatives called the Committee, the Committee on Natural Resources. They're trying to decide whether they can make your bill just a little bit better than it is now for all the people of the country. And I've just been told that the Natural Resources Committee has reported your bill, the Urkel Air Bill, and recommended that the full House of Representatives vote for it. I am in support of this legislation on behalf Chairman, of... Chairman, I do not support the bill, and I will not support the bill I under any... I think we could make this a pretty good bill. I really congratulate you. No way! You. This is probably the worst piece I of... I warmly legal. support this and hope that it will pass... I thoroughly later. urge my colleagues' support for passage. The Urkel Air Bill was reported by the Natural Resources Committee. The vote in the House was 231 for, 204 against. The Urkel Air Bill has now been passed by the House of Representatives. Okay, my bill passed the House, but it's a little different than the one that passed in the Senate. In other words, my bill's now two bills, and these guys are going to work out the differences. I'm not allowed inside, but that's no problem for the earth man. Oh. Oh. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Yes? Okay. Give it to me straight. I can take it. It's been approved here by the conference committee, but they've made some changes. And now I have to take it to the House and the Senate for another vote. What in Sam Hill going on on this hill? We just went through that. You hoodie hoo, Senator Dowell, it's your old pal Steve. Well, congratulations, Steve. I understand your bill has cleared the conference committee. That's right. But thanks to you, I have to wait for another vote. No, no, you have to understand. Your bill passes the House, then it passes the Senate, but it's a little different in each case, so it goes to a conference committee, and they clear up the differences. Then it has to clear each House again. But I've just been told uh, your bill's in great shape. Very interesting. Listen, by any chance, do you yodel? yodel a hee hoo No, but my dog barks, and when I was in the 10th Mountain Division years ago, I did yodel a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah, not as good as you can. The question is on final passage of the bill. Committees in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No! And you're the chair, the ayes have it. Hello? This is Stephen Q. Urkel calling. Is Bill there? Well, they've been telling me it was the Urk man calling. Well, there's no need to get all huffy about it. Well, listen, he's got my bill and he's had it for the last six days. If he doesn't sign it within the next four, it'll automatically become a law. Okay, I'll hold. I'll be here till Thursday. Get some sleep. <laughs> Isn't that great? That was great. Yeah. I have a present for you, Mr. President. The Urkel Clean Air Act. <laughs> like all government bills today on recycled paper. That's good. That's yeah. right. We use a lot of recycled paper. That's right. So you have a chance now to sign that bill or you can veto that bill, right? That's right. I have to, I have to act within 10 days of getting it. Right. I can sign it or veto it. I think I better sign it, don't you? <laughs> I think you better. I think you should sign it. Okay. Let's go back to question. Venus, you have a question. 
As a new president, are you, how are you going to end homelessness or what are you going to do to end homelessness in the world? You want to say anything about Venus? Yeah, I do. I do. It's a tough question for Venus. And, I, and, I, and I, we told the president before that Venus had come to us from the West Coast. And I think it would help if the rest of you kids here and the audience at home saw a little bit about the circumstances in which she lives. It's not fun not to have a house. I can't have friends spend the night over my house because I don't have a house. I have just a bed. You know, when they walk me home, they're going to have to know I live in a shelter. Sometimes I get ashamed, but it's, I have to learn how to, I have to cope with it and that that's how I'm living. You never know who's going to be sleeping on, next to you one night. The conditions living here is like, you got to get used to having a cold all the time, getting sick all the time. I hope that I get an apartment, that we get more help. Say your prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving me a new day. And if I shall die before I wake, I pray you, Lord, my soul to take. Good for you. What's your question then, Venus? Again, you repeat it. Again. As, as the new president, what are, what are you going to try to do? Or how are you going to do? What, period, what are you going to do <coughs> to end homelessness in our world? May I ask you a question? How did you become homeless? Um, I came from New York around five months ago, and we didn't have an exact place to go to. So we went to the social services, and from there on, I, it was homeless until we could get an apartment. I think there are two or three things we should do. And I ask her this question because uh, over a third of the homeless people in America now are families with children. And a lot of them are people who just moved from one town. Thank you, Peter. A lot of them are people who moved from one town to the other, and they have no savings. They have no money in the bank. I met a homeless couple in my hometown about a year ago. It was kind of like you. They'd come down from Chicago, and they actually had jobs, but they hadn't drawn a paycheck yet. They had no place to live. <coughs> so here are the things that I, we're going to try to do. First of all, we're going to try to build more housing for low-income working people. We haven't had much of a housing program for a long time. Secondly, I'm going to have an inventory done. Of, an inventory means a list done of all the housing in America which exists today that belongs to the government, which is boarded up or closed down, and see whether or not we can't give a lot of that housing back to churches or community groups or other groups and let people work on repairing it. And if they do work on repairing it, they should be able to live in it. I met a woman and her children in Philadelphia who were doing a lot of their own work on a home, an old home that had been boarded up. They were going to get to move in it and live there because of the work they had done to do it. The third thing we have to do is to create more jobs because a lot of homeless people wouldn't be homeless if they had jobs. One of the things about all your answers, Mr. President, <coughs> and I don't want to take time away from them, is that they all seem to be long-term. And Venus has a short-term problem, and Purnell has a short-term problem, and Shannon has a short-term problem. Well, I think, to be fair, though, if you look at Venus's problem, it wouldn't necessarily be a long-term problem if we increased the capacities of cities throughout this country to move people directly into more stable environments. I know in San Francisco, there was a real detailed ho homeless program that I saw there that uh, the administration wanted to put in that they just didn't have the money to put in because there was no partnership with the national government. And my feeling on the homeless issue is that a lot of Americans who have money in homes really want us to do something about it and would really support our doing more about it. I don't think Americans like the fact that children like you, your mother, are in homeless shelters just because you have to move from one town to the other. Now, on, on your problem, Purnell. on Purnell's problem, it's, it's a little different because you have to do a lot of medical research to find out exactly what's causing this. But I think you will see uh, this year greater efforts in environmental cleanup all over the country if our program passes this year. It's not too late, but as Purnell probably knows since you've studied your brother's problem, a lot of times these cancers develop over two or five or ten and sometimes even over 20 years. So they are long-term problems and, and we, 
we did a lot of things to our environment in the past because we didn't know what it was doing. And I think now we just have to turn it around. We just have to start cleaning up more. And I think most Americans want to do that. Okay, we have an awful lot of questions, obviously. We're going to go away for just a minute. Let you have a drink of water. We'll be right back. Thanks. I'm a little hoarse, yeah. <laughs> I'll go get some water. President Clinton answering children's questions. We'll continue in a moment. Well, Mr. President, I must tell you, as, as impressed as we all are to have you here, and as good as they think you've been so far, there's somebody else they'd like to meet more, and you know that. So we do have a bit of a surprise for you. Chelsea, would you come and join us for a second? Yeah. This is, these are the two people that you've all been asking about. Do you want to sit on the stool? Sure. Two people that the boys and girls have all been asking about this morning, Chelsea and Socks. I know who, you all had a question about Socks, so who wants to go? Jenny had a question. What? Why did you um, call your cat Socks? Yeah, who knows? Guess. Why don't we call him Socks? Hold him up, Chelsea. Why do we call him Socks? Because he has white paws. He's a black cat with white paws. That's right. Good and he's very you. restless, right? Yeah, I had to wake yeah. him up. <laughs> Does he really? Does he really have the run of the White House? Yeah, basically. He can go wherever he wants. That's great. Who else has a question? Yes. All right, Jamie in St. Louis has a question for okay. Chelsea. Go ahead, Jamie. I do. What's that like? Um, it's okay. They stay out of the way. <laughs> they, they do. They, um, have an office up on the third floor of my school, and they sit there most of the day, or they, when I'm in gym, they come outside and just sit on the bleachers or just watch my soccer practice. Okay. Who else? Yeah, way at the back. What kind of cat food do you feed socks? Dry cat food, I don't know the brand. Okay, nor Sorry. should you probably. <laughs> yes, right here, Omar? Um, how old is Socks? Socks is almost three years old. He will be three years old in July. Demetrius, way at the back. Um, does Socks, uh, the, who trains him? Is he trained? Yes. Like, do you guys play with him? And also, um, the, do you ever have to talk to her about playing with her when she's supposed to do her homework? Never. Oh. She's very good about that. <laughs> okay. She does her homework pretty well. Christine in Fulton, Mississippi has a question for you. Mr. President? Um, how do you and uh, Miss Clinton punish Chelsea when she doesn't listen? <laughs> I didn't know that. How do she they has, punish you? How do I punish you when you don't listen? I always listen. You like <laughs> Chelsea's a pretty good girl. We don't have uh, much of that. Sometimes we have to uh, make her, the, the number one thing we have to do is to make her go to bed earlier. She, she has a fault that her father has, which is that she would stay up too late at night if I let her do that. So the number one thing we have to do is to make her go to bed earlier. And one more question for Chelsea. Yes, Robert. Um, is Chelsea single? <laughs> <laughs> she better be. <laughs> Okay. You're really nice to come by, Chelsea. Oh, Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Isn't that nice to have her come by? Yeah. That's great. All right, now let's get back to you, sir. You got off the hook there for a few minutes. I loved it. Kevin, you said your hand. I have a question about how things go in. Would you speak a little closer to your microphone, Kevin? And I have a big brother named Jason. He's 17 now and will be graduating high school soon. Will you have a health insurance program in place so that people like my brother and my twin sister can buy health insurance? If so, how will it work? Will, it be, will we be able to afford it? Good for you. Is there anything you want to say about Kevin, Peter, before not I just, Not just yet. Okay. The, the answer to your question is that if we're going to present a program to the Congress, and if they adopt it, then every American will be able to get health insurance, either by from the government or from their place of employment. 
and they will be able to afford it because for people with lower incomes, the, the premiums will be less. But everybody pretty much will have to pay something for it. And I think that's important. But we want to make it possible for people all over the country to have some health insurance. There are over 35 million people in America today that don't have any health insurance and many others who can't change their jobs because if they change jobs, they would lose it. Uh, on Monday night when you were speaking, or Wednesday night when you were speaking to the Congress, um, you ad lib, you took off talking about health care as if you think there's no more complicated problem in the country. It's the most complicated problem I've ever dealt with, but also the most important. I mean, American families, millions of them, are so insecure about their health care, and yet, we're, I, I say again, we're spending 30% more than any other country on mm -hmm. earth. We have less to show for it. We can do better. We have to. Bernice. You had your um, hand up there like well, she almost week, wore right? her arm out. She's been up there so long. Um, um, this is um, a question that refers to what Venus said. Um, you said that instead of where the best play, the best way to um, end homelessness is um, to um, you said to um, build houses. Well, you don't really need to build any houses referring to D.C. and over the U.S. because there are more than three thousand houses and apartments Absolutely. that are boarded up with no use. Do you plan to um, fix any of them up? Yes, See that's that what I, that's, uh, I'm sorry, that's the second point I made, that in the places where we have a lot of boarded up and vacant buildings, I think what we should do is to try to provide some funds to local communities to fix those up first, because that's cheaper and quicker. Uh, but we just don't invest as much money as we did 12 years ago. 12 years ago, we were investing more money on building homes for the homeless than we are now. And uh, I, as I said, I think most Americans are really concerned that so many people, there are people who sleep on the sidewalk within two blocks of the White House every night. And I'd like to see us do something about it, and I think most Americans would. And I agree with you, we should start with the structures that are already there. Angela. Um, Clinton, I was just wondering, um, I, I, I come from a drug rehab over in Fort Pierce, Florida. And I was wondering how, why is it that we always spend all this money on the supply of drugs coming in, like trying to cut it down, you know? Trying to, like, down in um, Miami, there's a $50 uh, million dollar operation down there that doesn't even work, trying to, um, like, like planes that fly in, where the cocaine Trying to stop the planes from flying right. in. What are you gonna do about the, like, the demand? How are you gonna cut that down? You know, it's like, you can never cut down the supply, but you can always cut down the demand. How are you gonna do that? You know that from your own personal experience, don't you? He does, yes. I appreciate you. I, I, you're a brave girl, and I'm glad you're here. The reason I said that is because my brother is also a recovering drug user. And I believe that's right. And I have a brother-in-law who is a defense lawyer in the drug court in Miami that teach, keeps people out of jail if they'll go into rehab. And I think, well, I can tell you what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to shift some of the money that used to be spent on excessive expenditures and some kinds of enforcement and do more to do uh, rehab and education and treatment for people because I believe that rehabilitation works. And I, I think that if we had drug treatment on demand, that is without delay for people who want it, uh, we could cut down on the cost of the courts, we could cut down on a lot of our criminal problems and we could rescue a lot of young people's lives. And we don't invest enough money in that now, so we're trying to change the priorities a little bit to put some more money into rehab. In just a moment, Mr. President, I'd like you to meet Shannon because we've done a little, Shanna, because we've done a little bit of, of filming out where she lives. But before that, I'd like to tell our stations uh, all over the country that President mm -hmm. Clinton has agreed to stay on for half an hour more and answer more questions. So we're going to go half an hour longer. We thank you for that, sir. Now, let's take a look at how Shannon is because I think you probably have as representative a problem in your family as almost anybody here today. Let's look. My mom and dad work for Rockwell International, and my dad is still working there, but my mom is presently unemployed. She's always been one to worry about money, and so I worry about it too. So we used to have extra activities, like we would always go to the movies every week, but we've cut back on that kind of stuff now. And my dad's worried about being laid off. He tells us all the time, you know not to worry about it, but we know, we can see that he worries about it all the time, every day. And I worry about it just because I feel so sorry for him, you know, having to do that. And her, too, having to look for a job, being, and they both had cancer, and 
they get full benefits going to Rockwell. I wonder like if they'll be able, and they wonder if like they'll be able to have the medical benefits. I know we'll get through this. Hopefully he won't get laid off and it'll just make it worse. I don't want to leave here. I love this house and everything around it. And I love my school and my friends. I, just, I don't want to leave. And I think, yeah, we'll get through anything together as a family. So Shauna, what's your question? Wow. Well, as you know, my mom was laid off, and my dad presently works for the same aerospace company. And they've both been treated for cancer, but now they're in remission, thank God. And I was just wondering, because of, due to her history with medical, with cancer, she's having a hard time with finding a job. And I was wondering what your administration can do in regards to obtaining health coverage with their pre-existing illnesses. One of the things you're doing, excuse me, sir, before you answer, is you're cutting back on, you want to cut back on jobs in the defense industry, right? Or you'll have to cut back, we which is to. it? But well, let me ask you, can I ask you a question first? Does your mother, is she covered by your father's insurance policy at Rockwell? No, her own, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure. I'm so they, they, they paid individually. They were covered individually from Rockwell. Let me talk about the health insurance, and I'd like to talk about your parents' jobs. One of the changes we want to make in the health insurance system of America is to say that all Americans will be insured in huge big pools of people so that there are, are a large number of people insured and if one or two of them get cancer like your mother, that their cost of care will then be spread over a very large number of other people who, are, who don't have that problem. That will lower the risk of any insurance policy uh, going, causing a company to go broke. And it will mean that we can pass a law which says that you can't refuse to hire somebody just because they've been sick before. In other words, I want to pass a law saying that you can't refuse to hire somebody because they've been sick before, but first I have to make sure that the companies themselves won't go broke if they do it. So we're going to do that. Now let me make a <coughs> comment about your parents' jobs. They work for, your father still works for Rockwell and your mother used to. We had to reduce the defense budget at the end of the Cold War when the Soviet Union broke up because we were spending so much more money on the military than any other country. We had to invest it in other things here at home. But we need people working in aerospace. There are about, I don't know what kind of lives you all want to have now, but there are about seven or eight major areas of technology which will produce a lot of the high wage jobs of the future and aerospace is one of them. And the United States has not done a very good job of trying to build up aerospace jobs in non-defense areas. And uh, next week, we're going to start on a major effort working with the Congress to do that. I'm going out to California and to Washington State, where Boeing is headquartered, and they just announced 23,000 layoffs to talk about this. So we're going to start trying to figure out what we can do to save the jobs in the aerospace industry and maybe to start building them up again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Go ahead, Elizabeth. I live in Northern California in a town called Hayfork, and we live in the forests. And my dad, he ha he had a logging business, and he had to shut it down because they're setting aside the forest for the spotted owl. And uh, this is my school yearbook, and I've highlighted the names of the people of the kids like me whose parents w will lose their job because of the spotted owl. And um, I just wanted to know what you're going to do to try to um, help people's people get their jobs back. You all see this? It was not a setup. I wish to assure no. you, Mr. You all see this? All the uh, the yellow names here highlighted. Anybody else here know what she's talking about? The spotted owl controversy. David, do you understand it? Yeah. What is it? What's the issue? Uh, well, there's. The spotted owl's natural habitat in the wildlife is being threatened by, um, you know, loggers and, you know, they who cut down the trees. It's like it, in the northwest of the United States, it's like, um, you know, that's a lot of people's living. And they take the trees and produce timber that all of us use, you know, every day. And um, now, since the owl was being, um, owl's habitat was being threatened, environmental groups got um, the forest to be set aside as a preserve for the owl. But, um, you know, but then when that happened, it hurt a lot of loggers who make their living off of that. So it's kind of a tough situation. I think that's a good situation. description, Elizabeth. What happened? 
Yeah, the, uh, let, let me say that in Northern California and in Washington and in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States where Elizabeth lives and where her father works, a lot of people make their living in the forests. Uh, they're, they're, part of the forests are called old growth forests. They're very, very old trees. And most of the old growth forest has all been cut down, but a little of it is left. And there's some logging in that. And then as Elizabeth can tell you, there, there are forests sort of rimming the old growth forest where their trees are newer, where some of the land is being ordered to be set aside for the spotted owl. We have a law in the United States called the Endangered Species Law, which says that if an animal is placed on that list, then it has to be protected, even if it costs some jobs to protect it. So there's a, been a big fight going on for the last few years about how much land should be set aside to preserve the spotted owl and how much land should be left alone to log in the forest. Uh, I want to make two points to you, first of all. And let me say, I, I, I live in stopped logging all over Northern California and Washington and Oregon, including some places where people should be allowed to log. So I have committed myself to organize, along with Vice President Gore, a forest summit. And the Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, in particular, is doing a lot of work on that now. We're trying to set up a forest summit out there to bring all the people together to try to come up with the best compromise that will permit us to save not just the spotted owl, but the other point I want to make is the old growth forest that remains and still let people log. Let me say it to you in another way. We could remove all the restrictions on logging tomorrow and even put more people to work. Not only secure your father's business, but we could put more people to work. But then in a few years, we have no trees at all to log. So the issue is, how can we have a stable logging environment and keep a significant number of people working and still preserve the old growth forest and, and by the way, the spotted owl? I think we can do a much better job if we can just get this out of the courts and start the log. There's a lot of land avail that should be available for logging that's been tied up in the courts that our government does not want to tie up anymore. So what I'm going to try to do is to put a group of people together to come out to Washington, Oregon, and Northern California and sit down and go through all this and see if we mm. can't resolve it so we can keep the largest number mm. of people working and still preserve the forest. So okay. what are we going to say? But the land that they set aside, like there's lots of lightning up where we live and there's lots of dead trees. And if we don't go in there and cut the dead trees down, it'll, it'll start a fire and burn it all down. But that's right. There are a lot of problems with, I agree with you, there are a lot of practical problems with what has been done. And that's why I want to try to bring, now that there's been a change in the administration, I want to try to bring our people out there and sit down with all the parties involved and try to hammer this out and resolve it. Unfortunately, it's been all tied up in the courts and a lot of things have been done which should not have been done. And I believe, all I can tell you is I'm going to do the best I can to preserve the diversity of the, of the forest, the old forest up there, because most of it's already gone and we can't afford to let it all go, and still provide a stable logging environment. Uh, as I said, we could build it up, but if we, build, if we built it up too much, we'd cut all the trees down, and if we shut it down too much, we'll throw everybody out of work. So the question is, we have to find some way to find the right balance, and we're going to try to do it. Elizabeth, we'll stay on the president's case and make sure that you know particularly when the forest summit yeah, happens. Yeah, I'd like for you, will you come and bring your parents when we do it? Okay. Now, Mr. President, I, I, I know you feel the weight of problems in the country in this room, and there's one other person here I'd like uh, to introduce you to and tell you a little bit about his life, because I know he's been wanting very much to ask you a question. His name is Joey. Let's meet Joey. Doc told me and my sister to leave the room, but then, um, I'm a kid, so I put my ear to the door and listened, but now I had AIDS. In 1984, I had open heart surgery, and the blood gave me AIDS. I come here once a month for about four years now. I get my medicine here. I take penicillin every day, and I take Periactin twice a day. I take my DDR. Since I got AIDS, this affected my whole family. Of course, my dad's out of work. We only have insurance for the end of February. And when that's over, then we're out of our own. It's like part of my life now, until there's a cure. 
the main thing is just to live one day at a time. And the next day comes if I'm alive, then I'm alive. So what's your question, Joey? Um, that, um, that President Bush, he took $350 million away from AIDS research. Oh, I don't know if you could have put that back. Oh, yes, and then some. We, uh, we right now, we're working on um, a bill for the National Institute of Health that will increase funding for cancer research, for AIDS research, for health research generally. And uh, I think you'll be pleased with that. In addition to that, in this budget that I have presented to Congress, I've asked them to fully fund the Ryan White Health Care Act so that we can deal with the health care costs of people with AIDS and the burdens that it puts on families. Uh, meanwhile, you hang in there. We'll keep working until we find a cure. Is that a good answer, Joey? Yeah. Yeah. yeah something else, Mr. President. Joey, do you ever feel discriminated against because you have AIDS? Mm, not a lot anymore. Mm, good. The you, things have do you think people are kind of over their fears, of, uh, un irrational fears of it now? Yeah. They don't care about it anymore. Like, no, no, I mean, they care about it. But it's like, oh, they're not afraid of people. Well, I hope not. Thanks, man. OK, thanks, Joy. Thanks for coming. Daryl, Daryl, Daniel. Daniel, I'm Daniel. sorry, Dan. <laughs> A lot of people across the world are fighting and killing each other. I want to know if there's anything America can do to stop it. The answer is there are some things we can do and some things we can't. Let, let's just take some specific examples, then maybe you can ask me some specific examples. Somalia. A lot of people were fighting and killing each other. Our country led a group of forces, but most of them were Americans, into Somalia. And because the armies weren't big and the weapons weren't great, and because a lot of the people wanted us to come there, we were able to stop a lot of the fighting and provide for safety for people. Bosnia, you saw the young girl in Bosnia. Much tougher problem because there are more weapons involved, the land is more difficult, the people have been fighting each other there for centuries except when they have been stopped by government authority there. And we're trying to find ways to increase humanitarian aid to Bosnia and to push for a peace settlement, which if the parties down there will agree, the people who are doing all the killing, we could then come in and help to enforce. Uh, Haiti, a country in our own hemisphere where the elected president was kicked out after he had threatened some of the people in the army and the government in Haiti, we're doing our best to try to stop any repression there and then to restore the elected government there. It, it, that might not be as hard for us because it's a smaller population, a smaller army, and, and because it's right here next to us and we can do things with and for them. So it's different in different places. But I think the United States has a responsibility to try to stop that. Uh, I'll give you, but, but there are some places a long way away. You know, I don't know if you saw the religious fighting in India recently. That's a long way from us, and it's very hard for us to have any influence there. So we, we're doing the best we can. And it, it, let me just say, it works better when the United Nations will do it, when other nations will go along with us. And it works better if there is some support for uh, a solution short of war. So I'm going to do what I can to stop the fighting and killing. I, I read in the paper this morning, I think, Mr. President, that you were considering making airdrops of food to uh, people in Bosnia who can't get it. Do you think you'll go ahead with that? Well, actually, uh, after I leave you today, I'm going to go discuss it with our aides. And, uh, and consider that as one option. That there are a lot of children in Bosnia who now can't get food and medicine because, I don't know if you've been seeing it on the news, but the trucks which have been delivering those supplies have been stopped. So it, <clears throat> we have an agreement tentatively to try to start the trucks up again, but we may have to go in and drop some aid into them. We have a question from Georgia. Go ahead. Hello, um, Mr. President. When you um, go to McDonald's, um, do you have to pay? Do they accept, or do they say you're the president, so you don't have to pay? Usually, I pay. I have uh, in my neighborhood at McDonald's at home. When I would go running every morning, they would often give me a cup of coffee. But if I go into McDonald's and buy food, I try to pay. I try not to have anybody give me food when I go into place. We we had it. We had it. Is Basil here? Where's Basil? 
Basil, you wanted to say something to the president about junk food. You told me earlier. Um, Vice President of Kids Against Junk Food. President Clinton, I know that you have received some um, bad press for an occasional trip to a fast food restaurant. My question is, how are you going to protect kids from being bombarded with junk food advertisements during their TV shows? Well, <laughs> I, I'm going to ask Mr. Jennings. I'm, gonna I'm ask, leaving. I'm going to ask Mr. Jennings not to take any more advertisement from junk food manufacturers. Uh, let me say, if you look at what the fast food chains, this is not McDonald's, if you look at Burger King, if you look at Wendy's, if you look at Taco Bell, look at a lot of these fast food places. In the last few years, a lot of them have made a real effort to reduce the junk food content of the food they sell. They're, they're offering more lean chicken, they're offering more fish, they're offering more salads and vegetables. They're really, I, I think a lot of the fast food places are trying to increase the nutritional content of what they sell. Uh, let, let me just say this, about 40% of the American food dollars are now spent in fast food places because so many mothers that and way. fathers work, parents work, and it's very important that you keep the pressure up through Kids Against Junk Food to keep the pressure up to say, okay, a lot of people work, they're busy, they have to, to buy food at fast food places, but increase the nutritional content of the food. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you ought to do, and I think that's the position I ought to take. That, go ahead. Um, what I mean is, um, all right, say you're watching a cartoon and something like they interrupt and then they, um, they have a, um, advertisement for junk food. I mean, they interrupt what you want to do. Like, well, let me tell you what the, let me tell you what the government does and can do. The government can require the people who sell this food to publish on a fairly, in a fairly large sign, like the cereals do now, what the real nutritional content of the food is and how much stuff that's not so good for you is in it. But right now, we don't have the authority to stop it from being advertised at all. Do you, you think there should be a law saying you can't even advertise junk food? No, what I um, mean is there should be like a limit, like so many advertisements per hour, because they just throw in advertisements. Okay. They just pay for it and throw in advertisements. Well, Basil, I think I, what you yeah. need to do, huh? <laughs> you, what you need to do is to write the, the networks, ABC and CBS and NBC and, and uh, maybe all the other smaller networks that advertise and tell them to reduce advertisements of junk food, limit to a certain number of hours uh, on Saturday morning especially. Basil, one of the things, I'll tell you two things. First of all, uh, when you write to a network like that, if enough of you write, they listen to you. And the other thing I'll tell you about the president, which, which I think you'll find encouraging, uh, though I hope it wasn't just a political statement, sir. Uh, the president very kindly had a number of reporters in the other day to, to have lunch with him, and he served us broccoli. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, we're going to go to a commercial now, which makes me just a little nervous. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> We have a question from California on the telephone. Go ahead. I'd like to know, as children, how we can help you achieve your goals you have set. Oh, thank you, Byron. <laughs> Paid political announcement. Thank you very <laughs> much. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can, as a, as a student, you can write to your congressman and to your Sioux senators and ask them to support the program that I've talked about today. You can try to get your, your fellow classmates in your schools, your teachers and others, to get in touch with the people in Congress and ask them to vote for this program. And then at home, in your communities, if we pass the program, you can try to make sure that we do it right, that we actually spend some of this money, for example, to recover houses for homeless people, or that we put more young people to work in the summertime, that we do these things. But the first thing we've got to do is pass the program. So I would ask you, uh, you know, starting Monday, try to get your classmates to write your member of Congress and your senators and ask them to vote for the program. On the other hand, they could also write you in the White House and tell you that they think you're wrong so far. Sure they could. If you think okay. I'm wrong, write me and tell yeah. me that. Now, a couple of kids who, who aren't here today but asked me before, which is, I think, on these kids' mind, are you going to keep your promises? I'm sure doing my best. The, uh, the most important thing I can do, I think, is to try to give these young people a future by creating these jobs and dealing with their educational issues. 
and uh, try to do all the things that I talked about in the campaign. Sometimes circumstances change and you can't do everything you want. Uh, I'm, ha I, I'm not investing as much money as I wanted to in jobs and I'm raising a little more than I wanted to in taxes because the deficit of our country is bigger than I thought it was. But in general, I'm, I'm right on track to try to do what I wanted to do when I ran for president. Kathy. Well, I would like to know what are you going to do to help endangered species? Well, we were talking about that before, you know, in the Spotted Owl. There is a law which requires us to protect endangered species. And I, I support the law. I don't want to see it repealed. But I want to see it administered in a, in a way that doesn't throw large numbers of Americans out of work. And I think, I think most people feel that way. They feel we ought to have an Endangered Species Act, but there ought to be a procedure to try to have a balance between preserving those species and not hurting families too much. But I support the Endangered Species Act. Another telephone call. Yeah. You feel, do you feel uneasy about Mrs. Clinton taking such an active role in the government? Because if something goes wrong, both of you would be blamed. No, I don't feel uneasy about it at all. I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, she is a very able person. This is the first time since we've been married that she hasn't had a full-time job in addition to everything else. And she's got a lot of time and she wants to be part of, of my administration. And she's the most talented person that I've ever worked with on a lot of the issues that that I care about, and, and I think she'll be great on this health care thing. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to be blamed anyway. Adrian. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, I'm here today as a Lumbee Indian of North Carolina. Yet under the law, I'm not an Indian. What are you going to do to resolve this problem? Well, why is that? I don't understand it. You mean you're not a recognized Native American under the law? Exactly. Why? Uh, because the rules and regulations say that if a tribe is not recognized, you're not an Indian. And why is your tribe not recognized? Um, they're still trying to um, prove that we are Indian with the Department of Interior and the BIA process. Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yes. Yes. You've asked me a question I don't know the answer to. But I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, if you make sure, I, I guess Peter's got your address. I will put somebody to work on it the first of the week. I'll try to figure out if there is anything we can do. I wish I could answer your question, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that there were Native American tribes that hadn't been formally recognized. Yes, there's lots. Nor did I. Thank we'll you. find out for you. And right next to you, Thank Isaac. You very much. President Clinton, what are you going to do about furloughs? About what? Furloughs. You mean from prisons? No, I mean from teachers getting out of oh, work. Oh, you mean teachers being laid off? Yeah. I see. Well, where do you live? I live in Washington. Washington. In Washington. This is a problem around the country because a lot of state and local governments haven't had enough money to fund their school budgets. I think you asked me about that too earlier. There's nothing I can do about it directly because the United States government, the President and the Congress don't hire teachers. They're all hired at local school district level. But what I have, there are two things that I can do to help indirectly. One is to try to get the economy going again, because if people are working, they'll be paying taxes, and the school districts will have more money. That's the most important thing I could do. The second thing is to try to have the national government help our schools a little more than they have for the last 12 years. And the budget that I gave to the Congress does ask us to put more money into education. And that should help some of the school districts around the country. The most important thing I can do is give them a healthy economy, because most of the money to run the school district comes from the local level. It doesn't come here to Washington. Jordan? Mr. President. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how can you help the families where there's a mom, and she's taking care of a kid or kids, and the father isn't willing or isn't able to pay child support? And you have about 30 seconds, Mr. President. If he's not willing, we can have much tougher child support enforcement. I feel very strongly about it, and I've got a good program to strengthen it. Not able, and the mother is working and taking care of the kids, I think the tax system should actually give the mother money back if necessary. I think any parent that's working 40 hours a week with children in the home should not live in poverty. I think we should change the tax system so that people who work with children should be lifted out of poverty. That's a good question, Jordan. In fact, you know where you can watch <coughs> something that you're in the confirmation hearings for your new attorney general? That's right. Uh, because she has quite a reputation in Florida on that particular subject. 
We could go on. You've been very gracious to say the extra half hour. Did, did you enjoy yourselves this morning? Was he good? I loved it. Yeah, he was okay? Satisfied with all the answers? No. <laughs> I wasn't satisfied with all the answers. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, you know as well as I do, it's a rare treat for it's a rare treat for any of us to be able to come in here and see you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you You're all. You're terrific. Our country's in good hands because all of you. I feel good about our future just listening to you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you very much, and goodbye from the East Room at the White House. Thank you.